Welcome to week 10. Um, this week we're going to start actually querying the database, which is for some people a fairly easy topic for the first part at least. Um, next week, not so easy, but this week is fairly straightforward. Um, most of these concepts should be fairly straightforward to anybody who understands an if statement. Um, because it's not that different. Language is very different, but the concepts are fairly similar. I did post the readings. Um, thank you. And then I ignored it and I noticed it again. So somebody called me out and said, you forgot to put the readings up. I'm like, yeah, send me an email. Then I put a follow-up on it to remind me. And then I never actually looked at it for like three days, four days. So, you know, that's on me. Uh, but the readings are up now, so they're there. Um, so this lab that goes with this week's lecture is actually fairly straightforward once you've, you know, probably been through the lecture. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to dive into it. And uh, we're going to start talking about SQL. So. Essentially, what you're going to learn about is the select statement. Um, the select statement is used to extract data out of a database. And I don't know why they keep insisting about BI systems here, because you use the select system and pretty much anything has to do with pulling data out of a database. Um, but Essentially, the whole point of the database up till now, what you guys have learned is how to design a structure, plan it properly, maybe, I hope you learned maybe a little bit of that. Um, some DDL, which lets you actually manually create the tables, which is what I covered last week. Um, but the whole point of all that work is so you can put data into the database and then pull it out and do something with it. Literally everything up to that point was preparation for today. And it's like one of those big letdown moments. You know when you prepare to do something, you spend hours and hours and hours, and it takes you 10 minutes to do the job? This is what this is going to feel like today for some of you. Um, so we're just going to talk about creating basic SQL statements today. We're not going to get into the big heavy-duty ones yet. This is to introduce you to the structure of how, the, how it behaves. And... You guys have actually done a little bit already of this. You've run queries in MySQL if you start working on lab six because you were creating DDL and running it. Um, so, but in case some of you have not started yet, please refer to the slide on how to run a query in MySQL workbench. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over that. All right, so the basic data retrieval part of SQL is known as select from where. So those are the three pieces. And essentially the works, the way it works is the select statement tells the database server you want to pull data. You're going to tell it which columns you want to pull out of the database. From tells it which tables you're going to pull from. For today, we're going to worry about pulling from one singular table at a time. The more complicated stuff comes next week. Where is where I have my reference to if statements, all well, programming and an if statement, this is the where clause happens. Where is all about Boolean logic. And if you guys don't know what Boolean logic is, it means if A greater than 10, then. It either evaluates to true or it evaluates to false. That is Boolean logic. So you have a condition, it evaluates to true or it evaluates to false. And all SQL statements end with a semicolon, technically correct, but if you're running only one SQL statement at a time, then you don't need it. It's just good habit to keep slapping that semicolon on there anyways. So there is more than select from and where. Uh, there are three other keywords and they come in in this order. So select from and where I already described, uh, group by 
and having, they have to do with something called aggregate functions, which we will be talking about next week. Um, and then we have order by, which allows you to sort the results. Sometimes sorting the results is an important thing. Um, there's actually one more on here. It's not on the slide, but there is one more and it's called limit. And I think we actually do talk about it later in the slide deck. Uh, limit allows you to limit how many rows get returned. So if you just want the very mo the most recent record pulled out of that database, in theory, you could do an order by in reverse order with a limit of one. It would give you the most recent record. Yeah, limit is for the number of rows. You'll see it in one of the later slides. And for some unknown reason, here's a third version of the same thing. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the field list. So when we talk about the field list, we're talking about which pieces of data we want to pull out of the database specifically. Not as in, you know, a specific name like Dan. We're saying we want to pull a person's name or their ID or an email address or a combination thereof. And we have two options in the field list. We have the asterisk, which means give me all the things. So select star, which means give me all the things. And then you have the option outside of that of doing a comma delimited list instead. So you could go as a second example, which is select ID comma name. And that would give you the ID and the name. Right now we haven't even talked about what table yet, but let's say we're pulling from a customer's table, we'd pull the customer ID up and the customer's name and only that. Now, I don't remember if there's a slide later in this. I keep meaning to put one in every year I teach this. Uh, a lot of people learn that select star is a bad thing. It's not something you should do on the regular in a production environment. And here's why. Let's say you're pulling back a single row of data. It's a big chonker of a row. Say, let's say there's 35, 40 columns. Each column has, say, 50K of data in it. So four times five, add two zeros, and we're looking at 400K, roughly. Is that right? Yeah, let's go with 400K. One row is 400K. Again, you guys are thinking, "Mah, it's not so much. 400K, one row. Let me pull up Mr. Calculator here for a second. So we have 400K, also known as whatever number of bytes. And we suddenly are going to pull back 100,000 rows. Let's divide that by 1,024. 40 megabytes. I'm rounding up. I'm pulling back 40 megabytes by just doing a select star for the first 100,000 rows in the table. Now, people are saying, well, 40 megabytes is still not that big. It's like four pictures from my Galaxy S22. Sure. However, now we have 500 users asking for that at the same time. Now we're up to 19 and a half gigabytes. So we went from 400K to 19 and a half gigabytes because we're pulling back 100,000 rows times 500 users. And let's say that's happening every, uh, even once a minute. Uh, that's how many whatever bytes that is in a day of data. Um, considering that this is megabytes, gigabytes, 28 terabytes a day. Now, even though people say, ah, 20 terabytes, not that bad, it's 28 hard drives. Okay. The internet is a pipe. I'm sure you've all seen the meme about the internet is a bunch of clogged pipes. Can you shove 28 terabytes down your home connection? every 24 hours. 
maybe some of you that are lucky enough to have fiber to the home with a 1.5 gigabit connection might be able to do that. Businesses are not going to want to transmit 28 gigabytes of data every 24 hours. I mean, 28 terabytes of data every 24 hours. That's absurd. And the other problem is the pipe is that big. You're trying to shove something that big through it. You know, when you pull the plug out of your sink, the water doesn't just disappear instantly, right? It slowly drains down. Same thing happens. Everybody's got to wait their turn to get their data. And every time you've got something that clogs the pipe, everybody else has to wait longer. So all that to warn you about Select Star. Great when you're doing development and when you're trying to understand the base structure of the database and the data you're working with. In a production environment, you want to pull only the bare minimum. The absolute bare minimum that you need to. Because you know what? We don't all have pipes the size of Amazon. Amazon can easily move 28 terabytes a second between their data centers. I can guarantee that our little connection at my office, like the, where when I used to drive into the office to work, 28 terabytes would take a very, very long time to transfer, like probably two, three hours. So you don't want to do that. So that's an example of doing a select star. It just pulls everything up. And by the way, if you did download that database that's in the week nine lecture material, that's exactly what you'd see because I took the time to update the slides to have the same data for most of the slides. On the other hand, if I do just select name and city, you just get that much. Like this compared to that. Yeah, the picture's bigger because I actually had room on the screen to show the whole thing. And you can also swap the column order. So you can go name city or uh, city name. And that is what the select part does. Um, there's a distinct keyword that we can include in this at the same time. Distinct only pulls the unique values. I'll demonstrate all this stuff in a second. And here's limit to limit the number of rows. So now I'm gonna do a few demos to make this a little easier to grasp, I hope. Okay, so here's our select star from customers. And this database happens to have 500 rows. So it's not a super fat database, but it has realistic looking data in it. And you can see all the columns that are here. And it's realistic looking data, it's generated. So it, none of this is real. It just looks real, which is very important when you're learning, right? That's, I stopped using the world, the database, which is, you know, some of you may have noticed gets installed because it's very out of date and actually kind of offensive. Uh, the, there's another database that used to be used in this course and it actually, I think gets installed by default by MySQL. And there is uh, certain countries that no longer exist. And there's other countries that have changed names. And then there's uh, certain ways of referring to certain peoples around the world that are inappropriate. It's all real data, but it's really dated and gross data. This, on the other hand, is all freshly unique data that's not used anywhere else. Hopefully it's not offensive to anybody. So, if I do select star from customers, it gives me everything. If I wanted just the uh, name and city, there's my name and city. So I'm just pulling less data. Uh, the, the, the biggest issue here is this, my laptop is fast enough and the data is cached well enough that you can't actually see how long it takes to run it. You'll see down here that it's always zero, zero milliseconds because you know, the joy of modern hardware. Um, unless you're dealing with millions of rows, you'll never see this speed difference. Yes. Yes, you have to have the database and that's in the week nine lecture material. There's uh, an SQL file in there that you can import. Uh, the lab seven has the same instructions on 
uh, pulling. Uh, it's one that's a database called FlightDB instead, but it shows you how to do it there, how to import the file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just grab the SQL file and import it. Um, to actually do it really quick, if you, I'll show you guys right now. Under administration, so you you connect, you go to the administration tab, you do data import, and you pick the file. There's no point even telling you the target schema because it's going to create a schema for you. And then there's a button which you can't see unless you hit that bottom thing that says start import. And it'll just create the database for you and suddenly it'll be called order sample. And that's the example I'm using in class right now. No, no, no. This is just in, for those of you that want to try what I'm doing in class. Because it's a database that has like 90% of the kind of data I need in it to show every example of what I'm on, what I'm teaching. So here's name and city. Like I said earlier, I can reverse this city comma name, and it's going to give me the exact same data. It's just changing the order of the columns. Um, if I just want to grab the cities, again, and no, nope, not there, cities. Again, it returns 500 rows earlier. Uh, in one of the slides, I talked about the distinct keyword. Distinct operates on the entire row of data. So in this case, I'm going to run it just against the city. And in theory, you might it's really small, but you can see down here, right at the bottom, 276 rows returned. That means that in my table, I've got 276 unique city names. If I were to put the person's name on here, suddenly I got 500 rows again. Because what distinct does, it operates on the entire row of data being returned. So that means that the combination of Kirsten Moore plus Athens, Wynne Whitley, Whitney, and Overland Park, you know, it grabs the entire row, basically does a fingerprint of it, and only keeps the unique iterations of each of those. So if you've got the same name multiple times with the same city, those would be counted as uniquely. But if you've got different names with the same city, the combination of the two is unique. So distinct, the distinct keyword operates on the entire row being returned, which is why, and this is one of the dumbest queries, You're literally saying, give me the distinct everything. Well, it's always going to be unique because there's a unique ID. Like the customer ID is unique per customer record. That means that the entire row will be forever unique. I could have 100 copies of Kirsten Moore in Athens, but because the customer ID is different, it would still say you have 100 because it operates on the entire data set being returned. Again, another example of why select star is not always a good thing. So I'm going to go back to select city, distinct city, just like that. So I'm back down to my 276. Okay. In this case, yes, because I want just the unique city names. I could go, uh, I don't think I've got distinct names. No, I don't. Um, did I just, what did I call that column? Province? Nope. Hang on. Region. Fifty two distinct regions. Why? Because there's even less political regions than there are cities. By political regions, that could be a state, a province, a county. Um depending what part of the world you're in, they got different names for the same thing. So districts is another name you'll hear, that kind of thing. Um, so I've got distinct region and like that. So now I could actually go distinct city comma region and I've got 283 rows. That means that I have the same city name in multiple regions. Yes. What do I mean the distinct? Well, no, the distinct is just to make sure you don't have duplicated data. 
like sometimes you don't want duplicated data. Let's say you're going to pull, you want to do an email mailer. So you're going to pull out all the unique email addresses out of the database. You don't want to include the same person's email multiple times because they're going to hate you and then report you as spam. No, no, no. Distinct operates on the entire thing. Because there's Orlando, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. Exactly. So it, it basically grabs every column, the combination of all of them, and only finds a unique combination thereof. Exactly. You could, then you could, yeah, that'll be where I start talking about the where clause. Uh, well, actually, more of the aggregates, but that'll be next week. Um, okay, so I'm going to throw in the, the order by, which I haven't talked about yet, but I'll throw it in anyways. Uh, order by. Basically, it sorts. By default, it sorts ascending. For those of you that don't know what ascending means, it means zero to nine, A to Z. And depending on your database engine, it's zero to nine, lowercase A to Z, uppercase A to Z, or lower uh, zero to nine, lowercase A, uppercase A, to lowercase Z, uppercase Z. It depends on the database engine. They don't all sort the same way. You have to learn the quirks of what you're working with. Uh, MySQL is case insensitive, so it don't care. It's it's great. And now I can sort by city after the fact. So that's called the subsort. So what it'll do is it sorts by the region first, and then it sorts by the city next. So it takes everything that's in Alabama, and then we'll resort it by the second criteria. Second criteria. Uh, you can choose to make it in descending order by adding the des the ESC keyword to say it's descending. And if I run that, you will see that I've got my regions in descending order. Actually, let's go down to Wyoming. That'll be better. It's in descending order for the region, but ascending order for the city. So you can play with your sorting. It's, it's cool. You're not going to break anything because you're not actually changing the data. You're just retrieving data at this point, right? So you're just taking a look at it. And the last keyword which you have seen on the slide so far, which was limit. Limit says, I want five and no more than five. So to combine everything I've shown you guys so far, now let's go by region, ascending. So it'll give me the first five cities in Alabama in this case, because that's how my data is. So I'm grabbing everything that's sorted by region first. So Alabama happens to come first. I put in a limit, limit of five, which says I'll want the first five records I find. And this is where a lot of people go, wait a second, this sounds an awful lot like an, an English sentence. It is. Normally, if you can read your SQL statement, like it's a sentence, it will probably work. Will it do what you want it to do? Not necessarily, but it is going to work. So if I were to read this, literally pretending I'm reading a census, I'm going to select the distinct city and region from customers, order it by region limit five. It pretty much sounds like a statement of work. And that's what the SQL language is like. Uh, it's very, natural language, I guess, as close as it will be. All right, back to the slide decks. Okay, so I talked about pulling in distinct columns, the limit, that's cool. I threw an order by just for shits and giggles. Uh, an order by will show up later in the slides, but you know I already showed it to you guys. This is where the beaten potatoes of today's lecture is. Up till now, it was just me laying the groundwork for this. So 
In SQL, you have something known as conditionals. There is a, another word for it which you may come across. It's called a predicate. They are the same thing. If you were to write a Java, a piece of Java that's an if statement, you go, if some greater than 10, your predicate is some greater than 10. That's a predicate. A predicate is a Boolean expression. In other words, it must evaluate to true or false. You're doing a logic check. So the where clause is a series of Boolean expressions. There's tons of operators. You can have multiple clauses. And why is the word brackets in there? They're parentheses. Brackets are square, parentheses are round. So you can control which rows get pulled by using a where clause. And strings are literal, literal characters. And you use, and this is depends on the database engine. MySQL special, it lets you use both single and double quotes, but it's the only database engine that does. So as a rule of thumb, if you're going to be talking about a string in the database, use single quote marks. And you notice there's lots of underlined words here. Use plain non-directional quotes. By directional quotes are those of you that work with Word or any of the Microsoft products or uh, the Mac text editing products. Uh, I'm just not sure if OpenOffice does it too. Um, when you hit a quote mark, instead of giving you the nice up and down, it does these angled quote marks. And the double quotes will be like, like almost like two commas and then two upside down commas on the other side. Those are known as directional quote marks. You, use, you have to use this, the regular plain Jane quote marks. So I hope you guys know what a string is, right? In Java by now, you've probably learned about strings. I hope you have. A string is a piece of text. It may contain letters, numbers, and special characters. You have to quote them. Otherwise, the database server doesn't know what to do with them. So now I am going to put in a where clause, get rid of this stuff. Like such. Now here's where it throws everybody coming in from a C-like language for a loop. Let me make this nice and big. Bruh, you okay? Yeah, apparently he fell off his chair. Damn. Bro. That was good timing. <laughs> so, the simplest operator in SQL is the equality operator. Congratulations. It's a single equal sign. There's no double equals. It's single equal sign. It's life. Some of you guys are going to throw in double equals and you'll get an error message. And then you'll go, uh, durr, but I'm doing an equality operator. Well, yeah, but not in SQL. So if I run this, there we go. I'm pulling only things in Ontario. So go back to my Read this like an English sentence. Select distinct city region from customers where regions equal to Ontario. It literally is, reads like an English sentence. So here's all our operators. So we have the good old equal sign. We have the diamond operator which does not work in Java, don't even try. Somebody somewhere in the last 10 years has decided to be very, very kind to C-like language programmers because they brought in not equal, also known as bang equal. 
In SQL, this is the same thing as that, so they both work. When I was learning SQL, we didn't have this. That's what we had. So often you'll see me write my SQL statements with this. Don't panic, it's the exact same thing as that. Okay? Now, some of you are like, okay. So can some, some people wonder what the heck does this mean? That diamond operator means, can a value be both greater than and less than something else at the same time? The number four, can number three be both greater and smaller than four at the same time? Physically impossible. It cannot be. Therefore, that's what that is. It's saying it's both greater and smaller at the same time, thus not equal. We have our good old less than, greater than, less than or equal. Uh, and that one's wrong. It should be greater than or equal. Sandra, that was bad. That doesn't work. It's greater than or equal. We have in and not in. That one I'll demonstrate in a bit. Uh, we have between and not between. Like and not like. So like and not like, we're going to spend a bit of time in here. And then the last couple is is null and is not null. Um, essentially, you'll see the keyword not. Not negates whatever it is you're trying to compare. And null is the weird one. As you will notice, it says is null or is not null. Because is it possible for something to be equal to null? No, because null has no value. Something cannot be equal to nothing. Even an empty string is equal to something. A null, a it's like the inside of some people's heads. It's a null value. I didn't say anybody in here, I just said some people. Hey, if you felt targeted though, that's on you. There you go, throwing some shade on that side of the room today. Um, so yeah, a null cannot be equal to something. Therefore you check, is it null or is it not null? And that means, yeah, it's null or it's not null. It's not equal to null because there's no such thing in a database for something to be equal to null. And then somebody usually gets clever at this point and they chirp and they say, but Java lets me say, is the variable equal to null? Yes, because Java is doing some post compile magic sauce for you. And it's, I mean, C is the same, PHP is the same. All the programming languages that allow you to do an equal to null is doing some magic sauce. It's basically literally saying, herder, is it equal to the absence of value? Well, there's no value here, so I guess that's right. That's what the compiler is doing. Java, on the other hand, actually cares whether or not something is null. Therefore, they give you a special operator. Because in the database, a null value might actually be a valid value. Or I should say, the absence of value is a valid value. That's still wrong, but you know what I mean. So I'm going to go through some of these and show you guys what some of these do. Um, and I'm going to start with some of the other operators first, which is where ID is equal to one. And muscle memory is a bad thing. So I'm pulling out where customer ID is greater than one. Than one. Customer ID is not equal to one. There you go. And now actually, let me really do this properly. No point having the distinct anymore. And come on, Dan. Actually, run this right. All right. Customer ID, anything but one. That's literally what it's saying. Or it's the same thing as not equal to one for, you know, those of you that want to be that way. And come back to one just to show you guys that, yes, this pulls up record number one. 
Here's our happy little operators. Now, we can go greater than three, and you can see it starts at four. We can go greater than or equal to three, Congratulations, it includes three. This is all stuff you probably learned in, in Java for your if statements. You just never saw it written like this. Pretty straightforward concept. Now, so that covers all of these. So the first bit here, I've shown you guys how those work for the most part. I'm pretty sure you know, I don't need to show you the difference between a greater than and a less than. I think you can figure out what the difference is. The next one I'm going to show you, though, is in. In is cool. Um, as a programmer, I find in quite satisfying to work with. In allows you to do a list of values. So, for example, I could go where customer ID in 1, 4, 300, 455. And it'll pull up those four customers. So it's essentially saying, okay, where the customer ID is in this list, and then you provided a list of values. And it operates on that list of values. So what it's actually doing is select customer ID, name and city region from customers where customer ID in this, it'll translate that to where customer ID equal to one, where customer ID is equal to five, is equal to 300, is equal to 455. It basically executes all four, but combines it into a single statement. <laughs> Way more efficient, programmatically speaking, if you need a specific list of values coming out. Um, the other choice you have also in here, you can also go, um, you can do it with strings in Ontario. Well, this is where I'm gonna prove that MySQL is not case sensitive. Uh, Manitoba, Manitoba, and hit run, not save, hit run. And now I'm pulling everything from Ontario and Manitoba. Lists are cool. And uh, here's the example of MySQL is not case sensitive because I misspelled Ontario and I slapped a capital N and it still pulled out, you know, regularly spelled Ontario. Yes. Yes, you could do this, but I'm going to, sh you guys can come, but the problem is you'd have to do this query twice, or you'd have to have a multi-part conditional, which I'm going to be talking about in a bit. This allows you to have a nice short query that's easier to read. I find this easier to read. Some people don't, but some people do. Um, so that's the in. Now, I'm going to go back to my customer ID version of this, like such. And I'm going to show you guys the not in. And please note, watching the data, what's going to happen. So this currently returns four rows. If I do not in, it returns 496 rows. It's saying, give me everybody who is not in this list. Therefore, it's saying, is the customer ID not equal to one? Good. Is it not equal to five? Good. Is it not equal to 300? Good. As long as it's not equal to those values, the conditional of the data comes out as true, so it returns it to you. So that's in and not in. And I already did that one. All right, so I am going to show you guys a multi-conditional, even though I'm sure it actually talks about it later in the slides. Actually, let's go with the region. And this one will not work. Well, it's gonna work. but it's not gonna work the way you think it is. <clears throat> it returns nothing. 
Can anybody tell me why it doesn't work? That's what she was about to say. She, you, you started talking, she went like this. Yes, each row of data has only one value. Now, at this point, I'm saying, give me this data from customers where the region is Ontario and the region is Manitoba at the same time. Can you be in Ontario and Manitoba at the same time? Physically. I guess you could sit on the friggin' line and say, I'm both, duh. But no, not really. You're still in only one or the other. Uh, you're not going to divide yourself subatomically to be perfectly on both sides. You'd write it with or. And then it gives me the exact same result as the in. So earlier when... Um, I can't remember his last name, not his first name. Anyways, when he was talking about, isn't that the same thing as he did earlier? Kind of. But in this case, I'm saying, I want to have everything that's in either in Ontario or in Manitoba. And that's one of the ones that, this, the or, when should you use the or versus the end? Is the one spot where the English language fails people. Because often you'll have a manager and they come up to you and say, hey, Dan, I want to know all our customers in Canada and the U.S. So our brains automatically say, well, I guess he wants everybody that's in Canada or the ones that are in the U.S. because our brains just automatically, you know, have learned that that phrase means give me both sets. The database server, on the other hand, goes, nah, you can't do both. So it's this or that. Yep. No, that's just a MySQL workbench thing. That's just allowing you to insert a new row. It's just some, yeah, it's a tool thing, not a data thing. You're not the first one to ask that question, actually. He asked it last week. <laughs> so that's the or thing. Um, on the other hand, we could actually go where ID, no, what's customer ID? ID greater than one and customer ID less than five. which will give me two, three, and four. Why does the end work here? It's because it literally will say, if the customer ID is greater than one, that means it'll be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, ad infinitum. And the customer ID is less than five. That means anything that's four, three, two, one, but we already excluded one. So suddenly we have two, three, four left over. Most of the work in SQL is you spending time figuring out the right way to write the darn where statement. Literally, I kid you not, it's literally what most of my day in SQL is, is figuring out the right combination of things to put in there to get what I want. If I go greater than or equals, less than or equal, and we run it, it gives me one, two, three, four, five, because it's literally saying greater than or equal to one and reducing. Yes. No, it can be all one line. I mean, if you want to get really fancy, I could sweep it. And now it's, you know, nicely tabbed and everything. Whatever. It's all cool. It's just whatever layout works for you. And it just, this case, it just really makes it hard to read on the screen with you guys. And still have it big enough for you guys to be able to read. So that is how you operate against, you know, they're basically math operations. And what's really fun Let's see if my skill behaves the way I expect it to. It works against strings, even though it's a mathematical operation. Is he going to fall off his chair again? No. Okay. So literally what it's doing is it's looking for any strings that are greater than or equal to A and less than or equal to C. And it literally is just going to use the very first character. It's a very sloppy way to do it but it works. Well, it's just, depending on the database engine you're working with, that may or may not work. MySQL just lets you do it because, you know, it lets you do it. 
Uh, yeah. You mean it's a bit like, you know, that toaster with the freed wire that still lets you plug it into the wall and press the button? Yeah. Zzz. Um, yeah, that, I mean, I'm not saying, I mean, most database engines will let you do comparisons and strings that way. Just, just saying it will let you do it. Um, it's just, how often are you actually trying to do that? Give me everybody who starts with the letter A, but doesn't have, but is, ends at C. It's not something you do regularly. It just, it's something you can do. All right. And I'm going to go back to my numbers for a second because there is a, this exact query, there is a much nicer way to write this. And depending on how your brain works, you will either write it like this, which is cool, because nothing wrong with it. Or you could write it like this. I'm going to put it all together here. which will give me the exact same results as the other version I had. Uh, maybe. Let's find out. Actually, yeah, well, A and B is cool. Apparently, is yes is the answer. You know what? That's something I've never actually tried doing until you just mentioned it. I've never needed to do that, so I've never tried it before. Uh, I'd really need to try it in my day-to-day -day database engine that I use. It's a lot pickier than my SQL about what you're allowed to feed it. Um, it doesn't let you electrocute yourself. Um, so between is cool. It basically it uses something called end cap values. It'll say, give me everything between this value, and it includes this value, and this other value inclusively. Both those values, that's what between does. Which suddenly, let me change this back to the numbers because it makes more sense for humans to understand the numbers here. Okay, we're customer ID between one and five. Some people will go, oh, hey, I want to have uh, everybody between one and five, but don't, don't include the end caps. In other words, I want every between one and five, but don't include one and five. And some people will go, well, I guess that they just want me to do this. No. It's going to say anything that's not between 1 and 5, including 1 and 5. So it'll be 6 onwards. Just, you know, cute little SQL tricks. Um, by the way, if you want every value between 1 and 5, and not including 1 and 5, the only way to write it is that. Because between is greater than or equal and less than and equal. That's what between does. Okay. So I just demonstrated this. And there's the between I was just talking about. I'm just reaching ahead on some of the slides. Uh, but, you know, the slides are there basically for your, your, for your reference. Um, and not between. Okay. So a quick summary on using those comparison operators. I demonstrated in, it's a list. Between checks between two values inclusively. Is is used to check for nulls and booleans. Now, if you're in a database engine that supports true booleans, and not MySQL's version of, what do you want for supper? Yes of zero to nine options, which drives me insane because MySQL doesn't have true Booleans. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, Oracle, DB2, uh, pretty much every other database engine on earth has true Booleans. In other words, I've actual true and false. Try that again. Oh, no, it can be null too. Um, I'm going to explain that one in a second. Uh, thanks for reminding me because I don't think it's in any of the slides. So you can check if something is null or is not null or if it's, it is true or is false. Which is kind of cool because you can write like a sense, you know, where active is true. And then you got the not operator, which basically 
says do the opposite of whatever this clause is. That's what not does. Now to get back to the Boolean and the null question that he brought up. Don't forget your question. A Boolean in SQL is a trinary Boolean, not a binary Boolean. So a binary Boolean can be true or false, yes or no. In SQL, if you allow the Boolean field to be null, it also has yes, no, and I don't know. So a null value in a Boolean field means unknown. So it's true, it's false, or we don't know. It's uh, not that hard a concept to grasp. It's, you know when you get these formulas where it suddenly says, if you don't know the answer, you know, have you ever taken this medication? Have you ever done, you know, have you done this in the last six months? Have you fallen, hit your head in the last six months? That kind of stuff. Over and over and over again. Suddenly, but it goes, if you don't know, don't answer yes or no. That's where the nulls come in. And you can actually run queries against that saying, hey, there's some questions that haven't been answered. So that's is. You check for null against a Boolean that way. Which leads us to, I am just checking my time, not my messages. Pattern operators. So, so far the concept's been sort of straightforward when you think about it, right? Select list of columns. Oh yeah, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, the between is greater than or equal and less than and equal. That's what it does. The If you want to not include the end caps, you have to use greater than and less than. Okay. So now we get down to pattern matching, which is not something that's easy to do in C-like languages. Just putting it out there. Um, most, I can guarantee, odds are, every single if statement you've had to write has always been if equal to this, if not equal to this, if greater than or equal or less than or equal. I don't think you've had to write a single if statement yet that says, if the value is sort of kind of like this pattern, that's called regex, which I don't think you learn in level one <laughs> or level two. Um, those are regular expressions. The SQL language allows for regular expressions. However, for 99% of the pattern matching, you don't need the insane power that regular expressions offers you. Um, instead, we have an operator called like and, well, not like. So the like operator says, give me everything that's like this. This, that matches the following pattern. And we have two wildcard characters we can use, or wildcard symbols. We have the underscore. The underscore represents a single unspecified character in a specific position in the string. Sounds complicated. When I demonstrate it, it'll make a lot more sense. But it's saying if you see an underscore in the pattern, there must be a letter here, I don't care what it is, but there must be something here. The other one is the percent sign, which is any sequence of contiguous characters, in other words, match anything, any number of times, and by any number of times, it also means potentially zero times. Because, you know, technically zero is part of any. People won't realize that when they think about that, but technically zero is part of any. So this the, the like statement is a lot easier to understand as I demonstrate it. Um, so I'm actually going to just do the demonstrations on it instead. Okay, so I'm going to go name, like. I want everything that starts with DA which is cool. So it'll give me anybody whose name starts with DA. Real nifty. 
Now, for some of you, you might suddenly go, hey, wait a second. If I go and there's nothing in here. Oh, it's, it's postal zip. And let me just grab the postal zip in here just so you can see it working. Look at that, it's giving us anything in the K region, which is really good for marketing purposes. Because if I want to catch everything in say, Ottawa, we go K2. And suddenly we're gonna grab everything in Ottawa. Um, Here's pulling out a postal code out of California. Or there we go. All the zip codes in the US. Zip codes in the States are kind of stupid, by the way. As you can see, we got zip codes that all start with nine, but that are going over from Alaska down to California. They literally assign zip codes as they open up post offices. They actually have nothing to do with where they are in the country. Whereas in Canada, if the postal code starts with P, it's Northern Ontario. If it starts with A, anybody want to guess? What was that? No, bruh. Newfoundland. Have you never looked at addresses? Open your eyes. Examine the world around you. Ottawa is K. K is before P. Because it's more east. The postal codes in Canada go from A to whatever it ends as you go east to west. Amazing. We actually had a plan. You know, that's what happens when you create things with a plan as opposed to, hey, here you, go. you opened up one in Alaska, here you go, have a postal code. Oh, you just opened them up in Florida. Here, have the very next postal code. Congratulations. It's the one the town was incorporated is when you get your postal codes. It's a really good system. But in Canada, you can tell how far you're east to west based on your postal code. It's kind of cool. I mean, it's not 100%. Because obviously somebody in North Bay could be more east than somebody in Windsor. But they're in northern Ontario. That means, you know, following the Transcan Highway or actually the train ride, the trains. Yeah. I'm educating you on Canadian geography at the same time. So, pattern matching. So, I'm going to go back to my name now. Because the postal code one is one people will grasp because they go, oh, yeah, I understand about getting mailers. I get mail, mail all the time. And that's how they target it, by your regions. That's why you get your, um, your uh, crappy cardboard pizza, pizza flyers and different regions have different things because they target them based on your postal code. And they run a query like that more or less to get out who they're going to target. So if I go name like D starts, anything that starts with D, fantastic. It finds anything that starts with D. Now, let's say I want to find anybody whose name ends in T. I can go percent sign T. And suddenly, I got everybody whose names end in T. I could say, I want anybody who's got N-E in their name anywhere. So that'll give me anybody who starts with N-E, ends in N-E, and has N-E anywhere in their name. And we can get really fancy with this. We can say, I want everybody who's got N-E, whose name starts with W, and then has the letters any anywhere following it. So at this point in time, we're slowly going to reduce our list and suddenly we got win twice. Go figure. Because I'm randomly picking these letters as I do this demo. So, you know, it works out well. So we've got two wins because this pattern matches. It starts with W. There's an any somewhere in their name. It could be the very first letters after the W, because I could say, okay, let's go, has a W and then a Y anywhere in their name. That's like the dumbest query ever. But here we go, we get Win Wyatt, and we also got Winifred Mosley, because it just so happens that there is a Y after the W, it just so happens to be the very last letter in the person's name. Nifty. 
So let's just say, so this is the percent sign, the power of the percent sign. So match any number of characters, any number of times until you find the next identifier of some sort. Cool. Now I can go this pattern instead. W underscore A. W underscore A reads, give me anything, and I, actually, I'll run it first, and this will not actually do anything, I hope. I was just hoping there wasn't the data that was going to match that pattern. This is saying, give me anything that starts with W, has a single letter, followed by A. But not no other pattern match. That means it would give me, you know, I don't know what that would give me for a name. W-H-A. You know, it could be anything like that. If I put in my percent sign, it'll give me, well, apparently Wyatt Cannon is the only one that matches that pattern in the database. W, one single character, A. Anything else following. So that is the power of the where clause. Not the where clause, the like clause. And of course, you can always go not like, which will give me 499 rows out of 500. It's going to be the opposite. <laughs> so that's pattern matching. And I did these, I did that. Um, I don't have any dull data in my sample database. That's why you'll see an example from, you know, that doesn't seem to match anything I've done so far. Essentially, you can go with something is null or is not null. It'll find things where, you know, catalog page is null. That means it'll find anything where the, there's a null value in the catalog page. Yay. And not null is the opposite of null. So give me everything that has a value. Okay. Now, this is a slide none of the other database sections have. Um, because I remembered that they did a really shitty job covering dates and time with the original slide deck. So dates are horrifying. They are the absolute worst thing in programming. Not just database, they are literally the absolute worst thing in programming. A lot of people go, how complicated can dates be? Leap years. Are you talking about a date and a time? Are you talking about a date, just a time? Are you talking about a month, an hour, a minute? There are so many pieces to dates and time, it makes things absolutely disgusting. So when you're dealing with dates, you've got to be careful. So when you query against a date in the database, it's treated like a string. It looks like a string. It smells like a string but it's not a string. Dates on their own are very easy. You can make something equal to, greater than, or less than a given date. It's when you start including the time where things get complicated. Because the SQL interpreter, and they all do this, it's not just MySQL. That's actually one of those moments where I was hoping MySQL was going to be extra lazy so you guys didn't have to learn about this. But no, my, even MySQL does this correctly. If you have a date time field and you don't include the part with the time as part of your query, it defaults it to dead midnight. Zero, 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 zero. Therefore, if you ask it to give me everything that was on October 10th, 2021, it'll say, give me everything that happened on October 10th, 2021, at 00000. In actual fact, I'm being really nice because there's actually a period and another five zeros. It actually tracks to like the microsecond. Most database engines will track to the microsecond of when transactions happen. So what are the odds that anything happened and was inserted in the database at that very microsecond? If you're Amazon, Potentially. If your mom and pop t-shirt shop, not likely. Because odds are your transactions, you're not getting enough transactions to hit that 
you know, very precise moment in time. So when you're looking for specific dates and date ranges, especially with a date time field, you have to use a range. You can't just say, give me everything that happened on 2010, 2021, 1010. You actually have to say between 21, 10, 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and end of day. Yes. No. Um, my screw will actually kind of work and not blow up. Uh, it, it will not do what you think it's going to do. It converts your date to a string and then does the compare. Which theoretically might work, but not guaranteed. So using the like operator on a date is not recommended because I can almost guarantee it's not going to work in other database engines. Uh, if you try to do that in Postgres, I'm literally going to tell you this operator doesn't work with that data type. It's like in Java when you try to add a the letter A to the number 5. You can't add a string to an integer without doing something to it. Same idea. No. That is just what the operator is going to do. It's going to say, bruh, you didn't give me the time part of the date. We're going to default to start of day. Congrats. Hey. Somebody was talking over there. All right. The other choice is you can cast it. Uh, you guys haven't learned about casting. You'll learn about this probably later this term or early next term. Really? They covered something like casting before other stuff. Okay. Fantastic. So when I say you can cast it, you'll understand this concept. You're going to take a date time field and cast it to a date. So essentially it's going to take the date time fields remove the time portion and just give you the date. So at that point, you can compare 2021 10, 10 no problem because you've made, you've told it to ignore the time by casting it to another data type. You're converting the data type, which is something, again, you know, in Java, unless you're using the magic objects, as in, you know, using the, the, the date data types, you have big limitations of what you can do with because it looks like a string. So, and I'm not going to use this example because it's terrible. I'm going to go to mine. So I'm going to grab everything from orders so you guys can see. And here's our handy little set of orders. And I'm going to go, and I hope my skill doesn't make a liar out of me. And go. And we have nothing. Why? Because nothing happened. This is the functional equivalent to this. Therefore, it's trying to match this exact time, which it's not in here. So Exactly. And now I got to go Google something really quick because I can never remember how to do it in MySQL. Come on, not missed. Can you tell that other people look for that exact same thing? Good old this. And tutorials point's going to have it for me. Um... So if I were to go cast my order date as date and take that off, because now I'm not comparing that. Let's see if it actually works. It works. So when you're dealing with dates, things get a little weird, especially when you talk about the time part of the date. You have to be careful because as always, the data is you know, set. So if you're comparing dates and it includes a time portion, you either have to do this, that's one option, or I 
and people are going to go, huh? Okay, my num lock turned off. 2022 dash. In actual fact, I don't even need the equal on this. I can just uh, take that off. And now my insert key's on. And I run this, which gives me the exact same thing as the cast. Now, why does this work? Because this is literally doing... that, which functionally speaking is almost impossible. So if I run this, it's going to give me the exact same result. Now, the database um, performance might be different based if you're doing a cast versus the compare. Uh, the, believe it or not, doing it this way will actually be faster pro, uh, for the database engine to handle than the cast. Specifically, when you say order date greater than or equal to this, it's going to say, is the order date bigger than 0415? Yes. Is it bigger than 0415? Yes. Is it bigger than 0415? Yes. Is it less than 0416? Yes. You know, whatever, right? When you're using the cast on the other hand, it's saying row one, convert the date to this, now do the compare. Row two, convert the date, now do the compare. You're adding CPU cycles. Will you actually ever see the difference performance-wise? Maybe if you're dealing with tens of millions of rows. Uh, or the database is really badly put together. Some employers want you to do it this way. Some employers want you to do it as a cast. It all depends on where you work and what their preferred way of doing this is. That's all it is. So they both do the same thing. They're just two ways to skin the same cat. And back to my slideshow. And here's the cast version. Of course, I actually took the time to throw in a cast in here and I forgot I put it into the slide deck. So you guys even have a programmatic example right in the slides. It's taking a date time field and converting it to a date before doing the comparison, which means it compares just the date portion because you've stripped the time off. So yeah. Yeah, and then you could you could actually then use you could use the like statement like he asked. Theoretically, you could do that. You could cast it as a string and then use like. That's really an interesting way of trying to solve a, a, that problem. But yes, you could do that. Actually, that that's good. Actually, that's a good talking point. Um, the other thing is that sometimes, depending on the database engine, you have other data types that are kind of nifty. You've got data type called year, where you can just store a year or a uh, intervals, something on interval. Interval is interesting. An interval is a period of time. So in scientific applications, not business applications like banks and mortgage people and you know that crap, schools, it's all business, right? Scientific applications, we have something called intervals. Intervals are cool because it tracks how long did something take? It doesn't care when it started or when it ended. It only cares about how long it took. So that'd be like if I told three people in this room, okay, I'm going to time you. I want you to run to the top of the stairs and come back. And I'm going to do it for the second person, run to the top of the stairs and come back. And all I care is about how long did it take them to get from the top to the bottom. I don't care that they started at three separate times. I just care about how long each of them ran. You can actually use intervals in this, and you actually treat them as greater than, less than, betweens, that kind of stuff. Same way, which is cool. Um, numbers, I've already demonstrated the numbers. Don't need to worry about that. And, um, well, I actually demonstrated that also, because obviously, that, how else do you think I was filtering data? So, skip that. Okay, which brings us almost to the end of today's lecture.
we've almost reached the end. And we're actually on a good pace. So we have something called alias. Aliases allow you to rename objects in the database. And it the renaming only happens for the duration of the query. In other words, it's a temporary rename. Man, does that make me feel old? Because I used to refer to the TV show at this point. And almost everybody in here is too young to remember this, that, that particular show I'm talking about. There's a TV series called Alias. And I used to say, it's like Alias, you know, constantly changing their name and appearance. And they're like, people would get it. That's a long time ago. I bet you felt old too, eh? <laughs> so an alias allows you to rename fields and or tables. Um, Later, when I start talking about joins, I'll explain about why you want to rename tables. Field renaming is good for pulling data out of a, and so, so that the, the fields are named an appropriate way when you pull it out. And it's really much simpler to demonstrate it. So you go select the column name as, you give it an alias name, or if you're going to alias a table, you go as whatever the table name. So, pulling out all the customer names again. And let's just say I want to pull out the name and the wonderful postal zip, which I cannot believe I left in there spelt like that when every other field is not named that way. It's 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 driving me nuts. Um, so let's just say I wanted to rename this because the uh, database application that's talking to the database backend is expecting it to come back a certain way. It happens where uh, the programmers wrote it a certain way, and then the database guy decided, oh, you know what, we really shouldn't call it that. We should call it this, and suddenly the, everything breaks because somebody changed the name. So then the programmers, instead of rewriting entire like thousands and thousands of lines of code, will update the one query and go. And actual fact, you should use double quotes. It's the only time that double quotes are allowed. And now if you look right here, you'll see that instead of being name, it's now customer name. And I could rename Now my postal zip no longer bothers me. Now it's a nice low lowercase postal code. It allows you to rename columns. People go, ah, oh, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, when I, next week and I start talking about aggregate functions, you'll see why this is important. But going back in time, there's a flashback. When I was going through school and learning SQL, We didn't, you know, we didn't have laptops to do our work on. We couldn't email our files to our profs. We printed our results on a line printer. So it was always a race to get to the line printer first because we'd run the command and then we'd go redirect to the line printer and we'd literally just start printing on the, the edge of the room. So I'd write a query like that and then I'd go redirect to line printer and you hear, <laughs> and you just start and out comes your work, right? But the reason we could do that, the redirect to the line printer was way back in the day, when managers wanted reports, they wanted their reports to have nice headings. So they could turn it around and go, and I have nice headers now. Now, if I took this and sent it to a line printer, my line printer would come out with nice headings. There, that was my story. But, you know, you got to think back, right? Back in the day, way back in the day, like early and mid 80s. No, I wasn't programming in the mid 80s. No, I wasn't programming in the mid 80s. I had to think for a second. Not that old. Well, late 80s, I guess, if you count, count cracking games. Um, 
Yes, then I programmed in the late 80s. And here's a couple of sample aliases. Um, that one's really fancy. That bottom one, it's using a function called concat. It's a string function. Did you guys learn about concatenation yet in programming? Take one string, glue a second string to it. It's called concatenation. You know, take some crazy glue, glue you to him, bang, and now you're one. Yeah, concatenation. There's a function in MySQL called concat. It lets you concatenate things. Say so it would take the location, slap in a comma, put in a postal code, put a comma, glue this, whatever, and it turns into a location as a single string. So, actually, I guess I could I could demonstrate that one really quick. Um, that's actually not going to be on any tests, and I don't think there's any questions on the labs about this, but if I go concat name, comma, like this, comma, city, and I run this, my column name comes back as concat, which, if you try to feed that into, say, your Java applications, it's, it might be okay with this. But let's just say instead I threw it in uh, as follows. And now I'm throwing in now some handy dandy square brackets in here. Java may not be having problems <laughs> with that column name if it's in an array. But if I were to rename it as, uh, I don't know, nice, I, frig, I don't know, that. Now it comes back with a nicely named column that can be programmatically handled nicely in your code. So when you need to do fancy crap like that, that's the other place where an alias comes in. Uh, it allows you to rename the function results. Okay, so that is the end of this slide deck. So what are you guys supposed to be working on this week? Because, you know, every once in a while I got somebody saying, what am I supposed to work on this week? And then I say, did you read the announcement? And they say no. And then I make fun of them in front of their girlfriends. That has That may or may not have happened in a class. Um, so you are going to be diving into lab, uh, lab, where are we? Smash lab seven, lab seven has instructions on how to import a database. Like I described at the start of the class, right? Saying, you know, whatever. They're pretty straightforward. Um, and then you have 12 queries you need to write. And they're all pretty straightforward. There's no where, there's no big joins, there's nothing. There is no limits, that, none of that kind of crap. These are all basic SQL statements. Nothing any harder than what I wrote today. Some of what I wrote today was harder. You will submit it as a text file. Why? Because Brightspace doesn't let you upload a .SQL file. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, and I don't know why. So just don't. And that is it. I will, the, the readings I posted apply to almost the rest of the term. So no extra readings. And that's it, guys.